I think now this is our fourth Ghana Trade and Investment Forum that we've had over the past decade. I think I've got to say, though, having met the new administration yesterday evening, this is the most impressive administration of any incoming government that we've encountered over the past decade. It has been absolutely fantastic. The senior minister, the railway minister, the uh, minister of energy, the uh, GIPC have been incredibly impressive in terms of really understanding what Ghana as a nation is looking to achieve, what it wants to achieve from today. and what it is looking to achieve in the very, very near future. Uh, the UK Ghana Chamber of Commerce was set up uh, about a year ago uh, with support from the Department of International Trade. Uh, and the aim of the Chamber was to support British and Ghanaian businesses uh, to set up platforms like this where uh, Ghanaian companies and British companies could meet to talk business, uh, to network, uh, and also to interact on ways to uh, you know, accelerate Ghana's development and so on. Uh, I'd like to begin by also thanking the delegation from the government of Ghana. Uh, they brought themselves here uh, from China, some of them, uh, and they've been very uh, fantastic over the last two days. Uh, we've met with UK Export Finance, uh, we've met with a group of British investors who are very interested in Ghana, uh, and today is also one of the days in the calendar. I think we're meeting other uh, British companies over the next two days. After assuming office just about two weeks ago, this is the first opportunity I'm having of engaging a group of private sector operators from both the UK and Ghana. And I wish to express my gratitude to the DMA and the UK Ghana Chamber of Commerce for facilitating the organization of this event. I mean, it really demonstrates your interest in supporting President Nana Kufuado's pledge of using the private sector in Ghana as a major vehicle for transforming Ghana to achieve greater economic development. It also demonstrates your commitment to supporting the President's vision of promoting and deepening the engagement of the private sector in Ghana with foreign investors so as to encourage partnerships that will ultimately create more jobs for national growth and prosperity. Hence, the presence of the very high-powered Ghanaian government delegation. The government of Ghana is therefore not only talking, but walking the talk. And it is my expectation that at the end of this forum, the government of Ghana would have been given a deeper and better insight into the expectations of the private sector so that it can improve Ghana's investment framework or architecture to make Ghana an even more attractive and favorable investment destination. For many years, Ghana has maintained a strong relationship with the government and people of the United Kingdom. And this has brought mutual benefit to the two countries. The United Kingdom is Ghana's leading trade partner. And in, in Africa, Ghana is, I think, the sixth largest trade partner of the UK, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, the third. I believe it is the government's goal to make Ghana the leading trade partner of the United Kingdom in Africa in the next five years. And I'm sure those of you here will help the government of Ghana achieve its goal. So there's a lot more that has to be done in order for Ghana as a country 
to have greater benefits, particularly in the area of bilateral trade. In the midst of the challenges facing the global economy, with its concomitant record deficits, protectionism, trade imbalances, and high unemployment, there's a threat to economic progress and social stability in Ghana. It is therefore important that the UK and Ghana, through the private sector, deepens and expands our engagement using platforms such as this to better promote shared growth and prosperity. Ghana has, over the years, had a very stable political environment anchored on democratic principles with comprehensive constitutional and statutory protection of private investment. Of course, as you know, we have had two democratic transitions through fair and transparent elections of one party in opposition to a party which has been in government. But it is really time for the people of Ghana to enjoy a greater economic dividend from the democratic enterprise through higher levels of employment, incomes, and standard of living. Hence the desire of President Nana Akufuado to build an economy that is going to add substantial value to his primary product, reward hard work and excellence, and support Ghanaian entrepreneurs and businesses, particularly those with proven track record, to become more globally competitive. In some, as he states, he's looking to a Ghana beyond it. I have no doubt that at the end of this forum, many of you will be convinced that it is worth your while to invest in Ghana because you will be guaranteed a globally competitive return on your investment. The, pres the prospects of Ghana, I must say, are very bright. With its people under the leadership of President Akufuado, determined to work harder to enable Ghana become what I term a leading African lion, comparable to the economies of East Asia. The Ghana mission in the United Kingdom, under my leadership, is ready to support and assist investors make prudent business decisions about Ghana. And as I've said elsewhere since I came, I see myself as a chief marketing officer of corporate Ghana. I'm looking forward to very fruitful follow-ups after this event. And I have no doubt that I can count on the support of the organizers and all of you in this direction. I welcome you to the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Our two nations. So I'd like to say a few words today um, about the um, importance of UK trade and Ghanaian trade, the mutual benefits of trade between our two nations. Um, because I want us to discover today, both through the presentations, the panel discussions, um, but also through the offline meetings that we have between each other, the nature of those opportunities um, and also the nature of some of the challenges which um, the Ghanaian ministers are seeking to overcome in the months and years ahead. 
So outward investment is incredibly important to the United Kingdom. And particularly as we enter this period of um, Brexit negotiations, it becomes ever more important that we're being outward looking and we're focusing on the, the trading relations that we can build with nations, particularly developing nations, who have goods and services and resources that we have an interest in, but also who have a market in which we can invest to help to improve um, the outcomes. And I think that um, outward investment actually, if done correctly, can help to improve the competitive environment in developing nations. Um, and I think that one thing to bear in mind here is that every UK um, investor has a choice. They can choose whether to invest in Ghana or in Cote d'Ivoire, I'm just saying that to wind you up, Minister, <laughs> or in many other African countries. But the point is this, is that actually um, each African nation, and Ghana in particular, is in a great position, needs to ensure that their um, environment is conducive to encouraging the money to be invested in the sovereign funds and to be invested um, in Ghana. But Ghana is a fantastic place. It's already the fourth largest export market in sub-Saharan Africa for the United Kingdom. We're already on our way there. We have amazing UK companies, many represented here today, um, who are investing in Ghana and who've been there for many years. Companies like Barclays, Standard Charter, Diageo, Tullo Oil, G4S, and Prudential, who do amazing things um, in terms of um, financial technology, if you like, in terms of um, making sure that um, less well-off people are insured for the kind of losses that they can't sustain. But we also have hundreds, literally hundreds of smaller UK businesses already working in Ghana. And this isn't by accident. Britain and Ghana share a special relationship. We often hear of the US special relationship, but I think the UK and Ghana share a very special relationship. We have a common law legal system, mutual common law legal system, common language, um, I would argue a common temperament as well in terms of our outlook on the world. And I think this makes it a lot easier um, to decide contracts, to do business between our two nations. And Ghana is one of the, and I, I, and I don't say this with any, um, with any reserve, I think that Ghana is, and has the potential to go even further, but Ghana is one of the best governed countries in Africa. And I think that says... Um, in addition, it's a great exporter of gold, of cocoa, of many other natural resources. Um, it has a, a vibrant sector in transportation, construction, telecommunications, and they've been growing impressively over the years. But it's not just about the resources coming out of Ghana, it's also about the investment going into Ghana. And what's vital in my mind, particularly on my recent visits to Ghana, it's vital to recognize that in Ghana, and we do from the UK, we recognize this, that actually you have a very young, energetic, and compared to the rest of Africa, very well-educated younger population. And I'll say something slightly controversial, but yes, we live in a high-tech world. Yes, we want all of the modern developments for Ghana. But in some ways, actually, there's an enormous potential, um, both for UK businesses who have agri -tech agricultural technology, there's a huge opportunity for younger people in Ghana to actually um, increase the productivity um, on the agricultural land in Ghana. Because there's been a massive rush to the cities, and I think that with UK support, with Agritech from the UK and with the expertise from the UK and partnerships with the UK, there is a great opportunity actually for the younger generation to see agriculture as a great opportunity um, for the future. And I'm not surprised, therefore, that um, the, um, the bilateral trade between our two countries recrossed the one billion threshold again in 2014. But there is so much more that can be done. And um, I want to be clear that um, that Her Majesty's Government here in the UK is committed to pushing the UK to the top of the list of preferred trading partners with Ghana. And particularly as the UK leaves the EU and embarks upon our new role as a truly global outward-looking Britain, um, trading with every corner of the world, then I think that Ghana is in prime position to actually take advantage of that, um, of that um, desire and those aims. So I'm sure that you'll hear a few words from um, the senior minister, Yawa Safamafo, in a few minutes um, about the changes that are taking place in Ghana. Um, but I think I'd like to make some observations from my perspective as the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy, having made three trips um, earlier this year, um, about the changes that are taking place in Ghana that make it an ever more attractive place to invest.
So I was at the inauguration of Nana Kufu Addo and um, at the 60th anniversary celebration of independence. And also I had a very memorable trip with our Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, um, in recent months as well. And uh, my sense that there's a real excitement, there's a real appetite for change in Ghana. And I've seen firsthand on the ground the level of opportunity um, across all sectors of the economy, from infrastructure to railways, we have the railway minister here today, um, to financial technology and so many more sectors. Um, but to achieve that growth, clearly there needs to be the correct environment and there needs to be the correct levels of innovation, the correct levels of expertise from overseas, the correct levels of investment from overseas to bring that about. Um, and we are a leader not only in technology here in the UK, but in finance, in the creative industries, in agricultural technology. Um, and we have, in, I mean, we boast world class solutions in those fields. And we're also the perfect partners to trade, support, and mutually prosper from and with Ghana in its success. And um, I'm one of them, I guess. Um, there is a huge Ghanaian diaspora here in the UK. Some say quarter of a million, I say it's closer to half a million. Where, so you have, we have this natural affinity um, to, towards Ghana. And there are enormous opportunities for transferring skills. So I'm pleased, I mean, I'm really pleased um, to see that uh, the government of Ghana have already um, started to make reforms and changes and are very serious about making sure that the laws that already exist are implemented on the ground when it comes to overseas um, investors. And um, I'll just name a few of them, but I'm sure that uh, Yao Safamafo will mention more. But the um, removal of non-essential taxes by the finance minister. That's a huge step. I mean, it's a really huge step. And even the indication that that's what's about to happen um, is important. The, the introduction of paperless documentation for shipping in Ghana. It's a little bit further to go, but it makes a huge difference to somebody who's um, importing and exporting from Ghana if there's a smooth flow of goods um, across the border. Um, and the proposal to clear the legacy debts around the um, energy sector. It's going to be challenging, of course it's going to be challenging, but just the recognition that um, things cannot continue as they are and that there needs to be a kind of clean sweep at some point, again, is reassuring um, to, to us here in the United Kingdom. And um, the further course of the reduction in the time it takes to register a business in Ghana and also the practical nature in which a business is registered in Ghana. Because we often know um, that um, in developing nations it can be that the law says one thing, but when it comes to you know, getting your land registered um, or registering a vehicle um, or getting goods through customs that are quite often the, um, there, there are, there's a lot of friction in those transactions. And I think it's the right approach the government's adopting to look at how these things can be um, computerized and streamlined. And these are um, essential steps and against the, back, against the backdrop of macroeconomic um, considerations as well. Now the, one of the key aims stated by the incoming president um, in his inaugural speech and around that time, and my ears opened widely when I heard this, was that um, actually he doesn't, want, you know, he doesn't want Ghana to be seen as some sort of aid supplicant, somehow an inferior partner in the international world. What he wants to see um, is that, um, that it's a trade partner, an equal partner in trade rather than a supplicant for aid. And um, being half Ghanaian, that really makes me smile because I think that the way that we lift all the boats, the way that we support Ghana and developing nations is by opening up trade. And um, I think that um, it's quite clear that the UK government is very, very keen to support that objective. Um, we have a lot to offer here in the UK. We have DFID, DFID's economic development program, which is, which is providing funds to very specifically targeted Ghanaian institutions, and that will continue to help in that transition to a, a market economy and a, actually I probably shouldn't use this phrase, a strong and stable <laughs> political <laughs> environment. Um, and the UK is also championing the next generation of um, entrepreneurs through the um, engine program supporting 49 um, SMEs so far. 
And in Britain, um, I'm proud to say that we have a, a government that is absolutely committed to free enterprise and trade and helping businesses to, um, to engage with, uh, with Ghana. And um, Tony Berkson, you're a hero. He's left his seat, but he's a hero, an absolute hero. The UK Ghana Chambers of Commerce is doing fantastic work in ensuring that when British businesses arrive in Ghana, there's a forum in which they can operate, where they can learn the ropes and get trading um, sooner rather than later. And let's be clear, you know, Her Majesty's Government will be a champion of UK business around the globe as we look to sign trade agreements in the future. And clearly in Ghana, we have, you have the kind of EPA agreement on the back of, the, on the, with the, with the, on the back of ECOWAS. Um, but I would ask you to have a think about the kind of opportunities you may be thinking, uh, thinking about um, as Britain leaves the EU. You have some amazing goods and services. If there's some adaptations or add-ons to that kind of EPA agreement or ad adaptations, then, then clearly um, the international secretary, myself and others, will be very pleased to, pleased to hear that. And um, I think, let me close by saying this. Quite often, particularly in a challenging world, particularly when there are enormous challenges to development, it's easy to focus on all of the problems and the difficulties and to get very, very much focused on that. But I think that um, coming from a business background and now a political background for the last 10 to 15 years, um, I think my message to Ghana from the UK is this, is that the UK is open for business, we know that Ghana is open for business, and I believe that together, if we focus on the details, yes, but if we focus on the opportunities, I think that we can really um, forge greater trading relationships for mutual benefit. And I am optimistic for the future of Ghana. Um, I don't want to see Ghana as our fourth late largest trading partner. I want to see you at the top of the list, and my role as the Prime Minister's trade envoy, working with ministers and working with the High Commissioner, is to try to ensure that UK businesses have an excellent experience when they arrive in Ghana, where they feel they can trade freely, where they feel they can invest, knowing that their investments are secure, and where they feel that they're working in a nation which is developing rapidly, has a solid administration, which is going to make sure that the returns are not only for Ghana, but for UK businesses as well. So thank you very much indeed for listening. I very much look forward to meetings with you later in the day. Thank you very much indeed. Most of us from the Ghana delegation are coming from China. I flew in here from Beijing through Shanghai to Heathrow to do a similar thing what we are doing here today, to sell Ghana and attract investments from China. I wouldn't tell the results we obtained from China, but we were quite happy. A new government came into being in Ghana on the 7th of January this year with a very massive win during the election. And the message was very clear to us as a new government was we fought the elections primarily on two grounds, to cure unemployment in Ghana and to fight corruption. Therefore, when we won, we believe strongly that we have to fulfill our manifesto promise and we are determined to do the same. Since attaining independence 60 years ago, Ghana and United Kingdom, as has been said by previous speakers, a special relationship and we would continue to have that relationship. But it shouldn't only be a diplomatic relationship. We want a relationship which will create employment for our team in youth. Today, all over the world, the youth is determining the direction of elections. And therefore, when you have a problem of unemployment from the youth, then naturally, you must have programs to satisfy that constituency. And it is the most important constituency, because the future of the country depends on the youth. It is a fact that Ghana has gone through elections very competently, we've changed government about two, three times coming from opposition to government. But that has not satisfied the Ghanaian. 
the Ghanaian is looking for a situation where the numerous natural resources of our dear country will be converted into development to create jobs for the teaming crowd. That is why the Ghana delegation is here. We are here to appeal to captains of industry in the United Kingdom, captains of banking sector in the United Kingdom, the technology that abounds in the United Kingdom to look at Ghana with special eyes and help Ghana to make use of its resources to create employment for its people. This government of ours is charting a new path. The president is committed to building Ghana that works in ways that make development possible, in ways that inspire people to start business and offer citizens the opportunity to improve the quality of their lives. Our change is also to make the public sector focus on serving citizens and facilitate private sector-led growth. Last night, I attended a private dinner with a bank, and we were discussing the public sector in Ghana. And my comment was very simple. The public sector in Ghana today see itself as a regulator, as the one in charge of champion direction, but took instructions from me. This is not the way to go. The public sector should see itself as offering support to facilitate business in the private sector. The level of unemployment we have in Ghana, we cannot resolve it engaging people in the public sector because the public sector is already full. In fact, it is, we have overemployed in the public sector. So the only avenue left to us is to create environment that will make private sector flourish. And we said in our manifesto, and I'm repeating it, that Ghana wants to create the most friendly business environment for the private sector in Africa. We want the private sector to flourish, to make money, but pay its taxes. We cannot have the situation where we look to the public sector for employment. And therefore, we have to change the mentality of our public sector to be a facilitator of the private sector, to feel happy that they've made the private sector successful. And I see that the mentality of the whole system is changing. People now feel that we need to change. You need about 16 different people inspecting goods when they arrive at our harbor in Tema. 16 different government agencies, standards board, everybody coming to inspect something, including three security agencies. There will be joint inspection. Every agency will join hands. We all open and inspect. And the due custom payments are done. We must make it easy for the private sector to do business in our country. And we are determined to do exactly that. The various steps you require to register businesses in Ghana, we've given the Register General up to 1st October to make it one-stop shop. We're not going to spend time filling forms and seeing different people at different offices and sometimes in different locations. It is frustrating for the private sector. And I'm assuring you that the president, Nana Kufado, has said, my government is in a hurry. In a hurry to do what? In a hurry to ensure that the private sector succeeds. Because the government wants to create employment for the private sector. The only way is to be in a hurry. Our economic transformation agenda is anchored on the following. Macroeconomic stability and debt sustainability. Infrastructure development accelerated industrial development and agricultural transformation. As was mentioned by an earlier speaker, Ghana is fundamentally agricultural. 
but we've done so poorly in agriculture that this has affected our growth in the generation of our employment. Achieving rapid economic transformation in Ghana will require a very significant increase in investment. We need a big bang of investment. Our president's goal is to move Ghana away from dependency on aid, as Honorable Adam Efriye said, to a focus on trade and investment. Ghana is not a poor country, given our resources and population. What we want is friends to leverage our resources for economic transformation. And we believe that we can find many other friends in this room. Ghana has shown consistently that it's capable of rising its economic difficulties and has the enviable record that when this government, the government that is in power today, came to power in 2001, Ghana was in HIPIC, per capita income of $400. Before this government left power 2009, we have moved the per capita from $400 to over $1,000. GDP growing from $4,000 to $16,000, quadrupling it. This is the track record of this government in power today. And I can assure you, with your support, we are going to do it and do it better. Investment opportunities in Ghana. Ghana has a huge investment potential in various sectors of the economy, from mining, oil and gas, financial services, telecommunication, transport and aviation, housing and real estate, construction, manufacturing, energy, to agriculture, among others. Ghana is one of the most endowed countries in Africa in terms of natural resources. Sometimes people believe God was indeed very kind to Ghana. We have oil and gas now, we have gold, bauxite, manganese, diamonds, iron ore, cocoa, fertile land, name it, with a population of only 26 million. God couldn't have been kinder than this. It is our management that has not grown in tandem with these resources to make the country develop, shine, and be prosperous. We are going to do exactly that, change the management mentality and make sure that we become prosperous. The goal of President Kufuado led government is to leverage our natural resources for economic transformation. Currently, we have 460 million metric tons of alumina in Yenehi and Chebi, which is trading at $400 per ton, giving our reserves a value of, say, 184 billion US dollars. If we refine it into alumina ingots, we will have 460 billion. So on the ground, you have 184 billion. You change it from one stage to the other, you have 460 billion worth of this. And you are generating employment in addition. What stops us from doing this? Analysis indicates that with an investment of 10 billion, we can achieve this transformation. And therefore, captains of financial world, we should begin to change our mode of thinking about financing. Financing cannot be business as usual. Can you have a situation where a type of barter arrangements can make Ghana make use of its four sister billion dollars in the ground with an investment of 10 billion? Because you are paying for it in material. Now Ghana has a problem with debt. Our debt to GDP is about 73%. So we are already up there. Our budget has put it to about 70, and we've tried to reduce it within the last three months to 69.8. Now with this debt level, and with our program with the IMF and the World Bank, we cannot borrow. That's given, we cannot borrow. 
and we need not borrow. So we must think of other forms of financing. We must think outside the box. Is borrowing the only way to access investment? And the answer is big no. And therefore, let captains of industry and banking think about how do you assist countries like Ghana make use of its resources to develop, to create employment without even borrowing. So we are now looking at equity financing, debt swap, and all kinds of financing that will leverage us to develop our resources. We are appealing to you in this room to think outside the box. Let us see, ask the question, how do we help countries like Ghana using their own resources create development and employment? On the oil and gas sector, Ghana discovered oil in commercial quantities in 2007. The initial estimate was 3 billion barrels. We have since discovered more and exploring is going on. In addition, the significant association gas with this reserve is making Ghana very comfortable with gas deposits. And at the moment, we are bringing out gas. Now, when you have that level of gas we have, what do you think? You must think about fertilizer production, you must think about petrochemical industries, etc. If you can borrow, how do you achieve these objectives? I'm throwing this to you so that we start thinking about going outside the conventional method of financing and make sure that we are there. The financial sector services. This is one of the fastest growing sectors in the Ghanaian economy. The opportunities include universal banks, development banks, investment banks, insurance companies, reinsurance companies, etc., etc. We know that when you come to banking, UK is in a class of its own. The whole world looks up to London for banking expertise. Come to Ghana and see how you can influence our banking industry. Change it for better and make it development oriented. Agriculture is the main driving force behind Ghana's economy accounting for 42% of the country's GDP and employing 54% of its workforce. Out of a total land size of about 240,000 square kilometers, 60% of Ghana's land is arable, it's first class for farming. Only 10% of this land is currently under cultivation. So we have a lot of space for farming and producing items which we can export to your dear country. The northern parts of Ghana has a lot of fertile land, but nothing is happening there. The cocoa industry in Ghana is vital to the strength of the former economy. It employs about 1.5 million people in production and transport. Ghana is the second largest cocoa producer after Cote d'Ivoire, and we are trying to work hard to catch up with our friends in Cote d'Ivoire. Over the years, the government of Ghana has implemented policies to promote value addition through increased processing of Ghana's raw agricultural produce. In recent years, the government has encouraged the development of the non-traditional agriculture sector in order to diversify the country's export base. Today, we are exporting pineapple to your market, we are exporting tuna to your market, and we have room to improve on this non-traditional exports. And we need your support to improve on it. The transport sector. Ghana has a population, as I said, of 26 million, with a huge demand for transport services. However, the transport system is unreliable and to some extent chaotic. Most workers, especially in the regional capitals, to spend long hours in traffic to get to and from work. We need investment in road construction, in rail. The railway man will talk for himself here. Ghana's mineral resources, gold, bauxite, foodstuffs, 
are located in the hinterland, far away from the capital cities and ports, and require railway services, require good road network to really assess them. We are waiting for your support. Housing and property development. Ghana currently has a housing deficit of 2 million units and require about 200,000 units each year. It has been difficult for successive government to close the housing deficit gap, which is expected to widen with increasing middle class population in our country. We believe that the UK can assist us to overcome our housing problem with innovative way of providing mortgage financing, which is absent in our economy. We are not able to lend long because most of the funds available at the banks are short-term funds. We have not developed the base for long-term funds to support mortgage financing, and we need your support. Telecommunication. Ghana's IT infrastructure is still developing and presents another opportunity for investment. Ghana's economy is still cash-based. There is the need to develop the IT infrastructure, an electronic platform, to make cashless payments possible. Honorable Adam Efri, I think with your support as chairman of the technology, you, you need to come and assist us to open up our IT system so that we can move along with a modern tandem. In terms of mobile telephony, Ghana is one of the fastest growing telecommunication markets in Africa with over 30 million mobile subscribers among the six separate operators in Ghana as at the end of December 2016. Even though the market seems saturated, there's still an opportunity for investment in this sector through partnership and acquisition. We need to get an introduction of more sophisticated, more modern methods to get it through. Other areas of opportunity include our pharmaceuticals. Ghana in West Africa has a very good base for pharmaceuticals. And most West African countries, when people are going to buy drugs, they insist on region made in Ghana drugs. They don't like drugs from other countries. I wouldn't mention names. But they believe that Ghana always produces very standard drugs. And we have a market. When you are investing in Ghana, don't think about the 26 million people in Ghana. Think about the ECOWAS market of 350 million people. Ghana is located right in the center of the ECOWAS market. Ghana geographically is in the middle of the world. We are on the meridian. The meridian passes through our harbor. And we are five degrees above the equator. So we are right in the middle of the world. And ECOWAS is on both sides of Ghana, with 15 countries and a population of 350 million. Be thinking about Ghana by looking at the market of ECOWAS, because people enjoy buying goods from Ghana. As the new government pursues its bold economic transformation agenda, we have our eyes on the UK to help us with our development. We've been partners for a long time. You know us, we know you. And I'm very sure that when you decide to invest in Ghana, you are investing in a terrain you are very familiar with. We are close to each other, even in temperament. So my appeal is, please come to us. The last speaker hinted of my story. I want to tell you a short story. I was the Minister for Finance from 2001 to 2005. And I gave very little money to develop sports. And just before, at the end of the four years, I was posted to the Minister for Education and Sports. And the new minister, the Minister for Education and Sports was posted to finance, so there was a direct exchange. Here am I, I've been very strict, giving resources to the sports development. Now, 
I'm going there and the minister is coming here. So I decided that I will never make a requisition for money from Minister of Finance for Development of Sports in Ghana. And that I was going to seek for finance from the private sector window. Football must not be promoted with the taxpayers' money. That was my view. Football must be promoted with corporate support. I'd been to Kolebu Hospital, it's a major hospital in Ghana, and I saw pregnant women lying on the floor, no beds. I saw children, pre-born children, two or three in one incubator. So I thought it was very guilty for me to give taxpayers money to promote football. So when I went, I called for the large taxpayers in the country, called for their list. I was just coming from finance, so I had access to that information. <laughs> so I decided to move one by one to these corporate entities and solicit support for Ghana's football. I've obtained a budget of 2.6 million US dollars for the total football. I moved from one to the other. The first place I went was a British company operating in Ghana. I had 100,000 US dollars. Then I moved to the breweries. Before I finished the breweries, I'd obtained about 500,000 US dollars. Then I went to one mining company and I had $3 million. My budget was 2.6. So the total money requirement to promote football had obtained it through the private sector window. The Minister of Finance met me after and said, yeah, we have never seen any requests from you on sports. I said, you will never receive any from me because I'm soliciting the money from the private sector window. We must be very responsible when it comes to making some of these decisions as a developing country, I told myself. And I think that on that year, that was the first time Ghana also qualified for the World Cup. Because I paid generous bonuses. <laughs> and it paid the dividend. Colleagues, delegation from Ghana, captains of industry and banks, Ghana has a lot to offer. We need all of you to join hands. We are ready to give all the support needed to make available to the UK investors, provide you a home for investment so that we can jointly benefit from the resources that we have in Ghana. May the good Lord bless us all. Thank you.